the reason, the reason that the tie is going to be evaporation. This is an evaporation valve. If we look at the way the atmosphere circulates, this is where a high pressure sinking dry air is, a very high evaporation rate. Uh, the converse of evaporation is rainfall. So places in the surface ocean where rainfall would take place, we expect to see lower uh, salinity. Close to the equator here, we see that uh, salinity is considerably uh, lower here. That's because there's a uh, high rainfall along uh, this, this particular area. Here we see a ton of of low salinity water, this yellow that's coming off the coastline of South America. What we're seeing here is the Amazon River. A huge influx of fresh water, polluting the salts, maintaining the low salinity. So you see here, right adjacent to this yellow area, we have higher salinity indicated by the two colors that we see here. So precipitation, rainfall, river influx affect uh, density. The other surface processes that can affect the density, uh, the salinity and hence the density, are freezing and thawing. Freezing tends to make water solid. Freezing removes fresh water, leaves some salt behind, so we can make uh, salty water that way. And conversely, when ice melts, uh, fresh water uh, dilutes the uh, salt and the water becomes uh, less, less salt. Temperature and salinity. Uh, the density. Well, what we want to understand and appreciate is uh, ocean circulation, patterns of uh, currents in the uh, surface in the uh, ocean close to the, the, the surface, and to understand ocean circulation, we have to appreciate the forces that are acting on the water right at the surface. I think we've all spent enough time at the beach, if you haven't, you better get right back out there, that when the wind starts to blow, the surface of the ocean starts to first generate uh, waves, but I think it's very possible that if the wind blows long enough that eventually that water has got to uh, get into uh, motion. And I think our the intuitive notion is we would expect the water move in exactly the same direction that the wind is uh, blowing. Certainly, that's a uh, appealing, intuitive idea, but we'll see that there's a, a problem. Certainly, wind blowing to the very top of the, the ocean is certainly what gets things started, but there's other forces that have to be accounted for. One of the forces that we should talk about real briefly is not a real force, but a uh, what's referred to as a fictitious force. It's a force that we have to take into account because we are uh, on a rotating sphere in space. We uh, feel that we're stationary here in South Florida, but in fact we are, are moving quite rapidly. If we were right on the equator, we know the Earth is, is spinning toward the east. We know that it takes us 24 hours to make one revolution. If we're right on the equator, we know the circumference of the Earth is pretty close to 24,000 miles per hour. So somebody right at the equator is, he feels he's uh, stationary, but he's certainly not from the perspective of a, a person that's hovering uh, overhead in a satellite. The person on the equator is moving to the east at a speed of 1,000 miles uh, per hour. That should be, uh, that contrast with the speed of somebody that's at, right at the uh, North Pole, right where the spin axis intersects the Earth's surface. If you're right at the North Pole, in 24 hours, you don't move at all. You chain, you spin around once on your axis, but you don't move. So in a place like Miami, we're between the equator and the pole. The speed with which we're traveling to the east is going to be less, 700 or 800 miles an hour to the east. It all depends on the size of the circle corresponding to the latitude uh, to, to Miami, uh, 26 degrees north. So as we move away from the equator, locations on the Earth are moving slower and slower. The slowest being right at the, uh, at the pole. The same thing is true when we go to the south. As a consequence of this rotation, as a consequence of different observers moving at different speeds, there's uh, apparent fictitious uh, acceleration. 
the true acceleration is what people would observe from a hovering uh, spacecraft. When we look at motion of water in the ocean, when we look at motions of gases in the atmosphere, they're all subject to this fictitious force. To appreciate how this force works, we consider the example of a, uh, a rifle, high-powered special gun that fires bullets. We look at the forces that act on that bullet because they're the same forces that are going to act on atmospheric gases and act on uh, water. The simplest experiment we can think of is get right on the North Pole, aim due south at Miami, have a satellite hovering over Miami, and compare the path of the bullet is seen from somebody in Miami and seen from the spacecraft. So, boom, the person at the uh, pole shoots the bullet to the south. As soon as that bullet starts out, it's heading due south. Here in Miami, when we look up and we see it's coming due south at us. Before it gets here, though, we're moving 800 miles an hour to the east, so we rotate to the east. So, by the time the bullet arrives at the latitude of Miami, Miami is moved out of the way. So the bullet would appear to pass to the west of us. The bullet would appear to be deflected to the right of its motion. So we would see here on the Earth, on a rotating sphere, we would see a curved path. The person directly overhead in the satellite would see the trajectory is a perfectly straight line. Perfectly straight line. What gets you from the straight line to the curved line is taking into account the acceleration associated with the rotation. We could do another easy thought experiment. Go right to the south. Uh, due south of us, right at the equator, we'd be in Ecuador. We get the, again, the satellite hovering. We get the, the gun. Aim at this time due north <laughs> at uh, Miami and perform the same experience. Please appreciate, before we pull the trigger, the bullet is already moving a thousand miles an hour toward the heat, even while it's sitting stationary in the barrel of the gun. So upon firing it, it comes out with the same velocity it had when fired from the North Pole. And in addition to that, it has a velocity component to the east of a thousand miles per hour. Here in Miami, we're moving to the east, but we're only moving at 800 miles an hour to the east. It's moving 1,000 miles an hour to the east, so its path is going to be to the east of us. Again, it looks like the projectile has been deflected to the right of its path. The person in the spacecraft now looks down. He doesn't see a straight north-south line, but he sees a diagonal line that's perfectly straight taking into account the 1,000 miles an hour to the E. So what we see from a position on the Earth, the position on the Earth is moving, it's rotating with Earth, we see that all objects are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. We can perform the same thought experiments, you can do this yourself at home, in the southern hemisphere, Everything would look the same, except the deflections wouldn't be to the right, they'd be to the left. This associated, this acceleration associated with